All right, everybody. Welcome to Bible study. Today is September 5th. We just went past a national holiday on Monday. <laughs> what holiday? The holiday of my birth. <laughs> Labor day. Yes. <laughs> Mommy gave labor on that day. You are so right. How fitting. It was amazing. And I, I spent the day in the bed. It was really good. And um, spent a little time with family at Laughing Crab. So that was always good, right? Amen. So uh, I'm pretty excited to get into the second part of our training on today regarding grace. Um, focusing on Ephesians 5. Actually, Ephesians 2. I don't know how I got to Ephesians 5. Oh, because that's where Rhonda left off. Amen. All right. So it's Ephesians 2 that we're focusing on. So tonight we're going to go ahead and open up in prayer. Does anyone feel led to open us up in prayer? Yay. Thank you. Use the microphone. Heavenly Father. Is it on? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, Father, thanking you, blessing you, praising you, Father, Father, lifting you up on high, Father, glorifying you, just giving you all the praise and adoration you deserve, Lord. Father, we thank you um, that we got here safely for Bible study, Father, and we thank you for the lesson that is to come forth, Father, on grace. Father, we learned about grace and mercy last week, and we thank you for just the revelation we got from it, um, learning what each of those mean and and how you give them to us liberally father and and you don't even have to lord father we thank you for that father we bless you i ask that we um learn that we each take something some nugget from tonight's um studies and are able to apply it in our lives going forward and to become stronger in you we love you, Father. I pray for anyone still coming, Lord, um, that you would get them here safely. And as we leave, Father, I pray that you would uh, keep us safe as well. We love you. Thank you and praise you. It's in your precious son, Jesus name, I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Before we get started, I want to ask our favorite question. And that is, how are you showing the world? that God is your father and Jesus is your brother. Are there any testimonies tonight? Any testimonies from last week, from today? How are you showing the world that God is your father and Jesus is your brother? I'll share something. This happened today. So there's a young lady that came through the pantry today and she said, I want a shirt like your shirt. And I said, she asked about our church. She asked a lot of questions. She asked about volunteering, but she wanted a shirt like this. And I said, well, that comes with a lot of extra stuff. It's a whole long year process and it's just all these different things, but, but she wanted a shirt like this. So just having your shirt on, I guess it says something, or I've had so many people compliment me on the shirt, the kid at the grocery store. I like your shirt. I said, oh, you like it because it's camel? He says, no, I like it because of what it says. Ah. So it, it draws attention like a billboard that we don't even realize. Look at God. And so um, I'm grateful because I think that this young woman may show up in church and she may come through the front door and she may say, I'm looking for Papa George. Amen. That's what I told her. I thought that was simple. But there's just a whole lot of connection. These guys inside said, what were you doing here in her whole life story? And it's kind of, kind of, kind of. But there was just a lot of connection there. It was It was very beautiful. So I don't know that she'll go with Tijuana with us next year, but. It was, uh, it was amazing. Amen. Amen. Any other testimonies? I have a testimony. Thank you. Um, so this week, I probably the last two weeks, I've really been focusing on honoring my husband and being a better wife and remembering to let him know how important he is to me, how important it is for him um, 
he and I to walk as one with God. And so I, he and I have been talking more about um, just God in general. Um, and just, I feel like I've been a better wife to him this week. I feel like I've been less, I don't know, irritated or whatever the word is. I can't, we work together on the deck and we stained and I helped him and just, I feel like I've been a really good wife this week. So that's my testimony. I feel like I'm, I'm honoring what God wants me to do. Amen. Amen. A lot of people forget about the simple stuff, the wearing of a shirt, um, being submissive to your spouse. A lot of people question, how do I balance it? Being the apostle of this church, but being the wife of Vincent Moody. And it's very easy. There's certain things that Pastor Vincent will say, okay, the Lord said to do thus, such, and this. Cool, we're moving that direction. That's what he said to you. But there's times where Stephanie's husband shows up and says, hey, we're not doing that. <laughs> you know, and sometimes I just have to sit back and go, mm. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't feel very good sometimes, but he's my covering. Amen. He is my covering. And so with him being my covering, I have to trust that when he's saying, I don't feel real good about that step. When he's saying that, that's telling me slow down and listen for the voice of God, because your passion can drive you into places that God didn't will for you to go. I have to finish my testimony. Oh, I there's didn't more? quite finish it. Oh, well, yes, you're... there is more. <laughs> but wait, there's but more. But wait, there's more. So on... Yesterday, Thursday, I got a text that said, hi, Deb, was thinking about marriage the other day. You and Troy randomly crossed my mind. I had a mind to message you, but didn't, and it's still on my mind. For your birthday, which was back in November, he picked up an order. Then, and each encounter, we get chatty. The amount of love and adoration and respect he has for you is refreshing. In a world and time where marriage isn't always honored, he That's speaks right. of you in the highest regard always. If I didn't know, I would assume you all just married. It's a beautiful thing. I'm sure you know, but I wanted to tell you. Creates hope. So many are wayward and total opposite. This is what marriage should be. Both of you are blessed. And I felt like God was saying, good job, Deb. Aww. Good job. This this is your confirmation that you're doing what I need you to do. Amen. Because I am my back. Because we come from a strong woman, we being my sisters and I, and we can all be a little bit overbearing. We know that. Don't drop your head while she's saying that ever again. We can all be a little overbearing <laughs> I bet. right then. So it just was confirmation and it let me know that I hear God. He's working with me. He's softening my edges, if you will. I mean, I've been married. It'll be 30, well, 29 on the 16th of this month. So, wow. Yeah. So you can you go through cycles. I mean, there's that honeymoon phase where anything he says is you're there. And then there's another cycle where you're fighting back. <laughs> yeah. It's coming, George. <laughs> is it coming <laughs> or is it already here? <laughs> so, <laughs> so just saying, I feel like that was, confirmation. And, and as you were speaking, it reminded me of the text I got that kind of confirmed all of that. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. And thank you for your, um, the way that you all show that to the rest of us, because we're 21 years in and, um, at 21 years, we've had our highs, we've had our lows, we've had our knockdown drag amounts, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've had them, you know, and what's funny is I tell people it was probably year seven when we started really gelling 
where we were able to finish finish each other's sentences, know what the other was thinking, um, have a fight and not be mad for two and three days. Mm -hmm. You know, we learned. <laughs> yeah. We, we started learning, <laughs> y'all two are real cute. <laughs> we, we learned how to, to talk. Even <laughs> he learned when not to crack a joke. Everybody who knows Vincent Moody, he's going to crack a joke. There's going to be something to laugh about. And he would do it at the wrong time every time. I'm at the height of pissivity and... <laughs> He cracks a joke and I'm like ready to throw something at him, you know? And he's like, I'm just trying to lighten the mood here. And I'm like, we're not lightning. We're not done. We're still on page one, sir. We haven't even made it past the first question. But, you know, he he's learned how to work well with me. And I had to learn how to work well with him. And see, when he's trying to lighten it up, it's like, Stephanie, you are on a roll. So if he's trying to lighten it up, you've really gone there, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's a beautiful thing to see a couple who can fight fair. Can I say that? Because when you've got two people in the room, there is always opportunity for a misunderstanding. They fight fair. I have witnessed it. As a matter of fact, I told him, you guys fight over stupid stuff. <laughs> it's stupid. I don't even know why that's a fight. That's just stupid. But, you know, they they work together well. And they, you know, they've shown to the world that, you know, what it means to be a godly couple. And I love that about you guys. Yes. Um, all, I, all I have to say is a couple of things is, you know, over the years, I've learned how to be a better husband, um, especially a better father to the kids. And for the men, uh, the one thing that she knows that I always say after we're in the heat of the battle. Good talk. Uh, <laughs> don't use it, bro, but don't. every once in a while, it, it, it helps. After she's at that level, and then I'm like, okay, good talk. <laughs> I get so as you as move on. You like, so just Oh, it's like in the kids. I, you know, we've we've resolved it, we've buried it, we've you know threw <laughs> tons of tons of gravel and rock over the top of it, and I, and I I think it's done. But she wants to get the last word, and I'm like, okay, and I let her get the last word, and they're like, okay, good talk. His last name is Moody for a reason, anyways. <laughs> but I do, I and it. it it's it's from my father because my father used to crack jokes all the time. Mm. And even though my mom, she'd be mad. And uh, that's where me and my brother, we get it from our parents. So, you know, when some, so I try to, even when she's really, really upset, I'll, I'll hold it in. And then sometimes OC and Kamika will hit me and O will probably maybe text me and say, not now, Pops. <laughs> Because he, cause he sees it in my eye, and they've been around this long enough. He says, Pops, Pops, no. Pops, no, no. He says, Pops, no. And then Mika's no. like, go for it. So that's all I got. Just in case you're wondering, she's always on his side. I don't care what he does every time. Back to Grace. <laughs> that's, literally, that is the answer. It requires grace. And, and, you know, that's the thing. Last week, we really worked on um, working on the uh, central issues of our faith. Amen. Areas that a lot of people would believe are elementary. Like, why are we going over this? But they're truly important to building our foundation and uh, forming our foundation in Jesus Christ. Amen. So our focus during this time is the process of living as a follower of Jesus Christ and we're working on maturing our faith in Jesus Christ. We put faith in everything, everything but him. When we came in, and I use this analogy all the time because it helps us to realize how much faith we have in everything other than him. When we came in, we grabbed a chair and we sat down, didn't we? Did we ask the chair, can you hold me? Can you, can you stay up underneath my weight? Can you support my weight? 
We didn't ask the chair anything. We grabbed the chair and we sat down. We just knew that this chair was going to do its job and support us. But we don't give God that same, that same um, uh, trust, that same faith, that same belief. Amen. So we're really focusing in on the components of our faith. Amen. So our focus during this time is the process of living as a follower of Jesus Christ, maturing in our faith. So Elder Rhonda and Pastor O.C. had started walking everybody through the book. Um, and the book that they're teaching from is called Sit, Walk, Stand. And it does a very good breakdown of Ephesians, um, the book of Ephesians. And we had made it to chapter five. Amen. And so we found that the book was divided into three key words. Does anyone remember what those three words are? Sit. Sit. Stand is the last one. Walk. walk, sit, walk, stand. Sit is our what? You were close. Sit and rest. Sit and rest. Ooh. It's our, starts with a P. Talking about position. Yes. It's our position in Jesus Christ, right? <laughs> Amen. And what is walk? Walk is our attitude in the world. Our attitude in the world. We are walking with Jesus Christ. Amen. And stand is what? Attitude against the enemy. Our attitude against the enemy. So sit is our position in Christ. Walk, our attitude against the world. Stand, our attitude toward or against the enemy. Amen. So last week we shifted our focus so that we could go a little bit deeper in what we've learned. And we began a conversation about grace and the importance of continuing to walk in God's grace after our initial experience with God. How many of us remember that day at the altar when we gave our lives to Christ? For me, it was in my bathroom. It wasn't at the altar. I was in my bathroom and I was plotting how to take my own life. And it was that moment with God that allowed me to know that he was real. And that is when my shift, my change, my dedication to him came about. Amen. It's more than just a confession of our mouths. We say a whole lot of stuff, yet our heart doesn't believe it. Ah, so here we are at the altar. We give our lives to him. And when you think about that moment, when you really gave your life to him, it may have been the initial experience that you had, or it may have been later on when you started really learning who he is and who you are in him, when you rededicated yourself per se, amen? So when you had that moment, you sat and you were with him. You became one with him. There was nothing that could stop you. Do you remember your first uh, walk into the grocery store after you had that initial experience? Was anybody like me? I was the super Christian. I'm in the grocery store wearing the aisle. Do you know Jesus? <laughs> I'm checking out. Do you know Jesus? I'm in my job. Guess what? I know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Was anybody else like that? Oh my gosh. Womp womp. Why, why, why Just me. That's, why, That's why I'm who I am today. Because I had such a supernatural encounter with him. I will never forget being woken up <laughs> out of my sleep when he called me. And him speaking to me audibly because I had not let him into me the way that he needed to be. So he had to speak to me audibly and I heard his voice and I argued him. I'm like, I don't even know the Bible. I don't know the word. I said, how can I preach? And he took me right, right to Jeremiah one. And what did Jeremiah say? How can I do this? I'm but a youth. I can't speak for you. He said, I have placed my words in your mouth. I'm reading that. This thing's coming to life before me. I'm probably, I don't know if anybody else had this experience, but I could read the King James after that experience. But as I continue to walk, as I continue to grow, as I continue to have to apply things, some things I got good, some things I didn't get so good. I didn't do so well with them. And so what happens is we launch into that initial experience, 
God has forgiven you. But then when you make your next mistake, you think that God has discounted you and he doesn't love you anymore. He's walked away from you because you're not good enough. You should everything right. Everything should be perfect. And he never expected that. He always expected that we were going to have to walk through this. He gave us example after example after example. Look at the disciples. Peter walked with him for how long? Three years later, what's Peter doing? Cussing everybody out? He done cut the man's ear off? Yeah, talk about it. I don't even know what it is. But yet, all of the things, he saw Jesus heal his mother-in-law. Did y'all know Peter had a wife? No. Yeah. Peter had a wife. Where was Peter's wife? While he was running around with Jesus. She was at home. Because the call that was upon his life called him to go. Moving on. So who remembers the definition of grace? Does anyone remember the definition that was given? Getting what you, not getting what you deserve. I think is what you say for grace. Or is that mercy? No, that's mercy. mercy. Grace is defined as, write this down. The unmerited love. That's it. The unmerited love and favor of God towards man. Amen. So that is the dictionary.com definition. It's the eighth definition and it's under theology. Because when you look at grace, there's a whole lot of different definitions. When you look at the definite, the definition in dic the dictionary.com, amen. The unmerited love and favor of God toward men, I would write that down. So I shared last week that some people use an acronym to understand it. And that acronym is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches, all of the things that are a part of uh, God, all of the miracles, all of the signs, all of the wonders, all of the power, all of the love, all of the peace, all of the joy, all of his riches. When we think about riches, we first think about what? Money. But riches don't always equate to money. My family makes me rich. The number of kids that I have that actually love me makes me rich. The fact that I have peace in the midst of some things that people would say, how in the heck are you doing that? Makes me rich. I have joy, unspeakable joy. That makes me rich, amen? So we receive God's riches at Christ's expense. What was his expense? He died on the cross for our sins. Amen. So he did that so that we could receive from God. We could be reconnected to God. Are y'all with me tonight? Hallelujah. So we also looked at it in the Greek and in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it was hain, which is the graciousness, kindness, and favor. And in the Greek, it is charis, which means goodwill, loving kindness, Listen to this, favor. When you go down a little further and you dig deep into it, it actually says, I need y'all to hear this, of the merciful kindness by which God exerting his holy influence upon human souls turns them to Christ. This is the definition of grace. Turns them to Christ because he influenced their what? Their soul. What is our soul? Our mind, our will, and our emotions, your soul is made up of your mind, your will, and your emotions. So he influenced our souls, turned us to Jesus Christ, keeps us after we've turned to Jesus Christ, strengthens us. Is that not some good stuff? Increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of Christian virtues. By this definition, y'all, we actually see that it shifted from simply being receiving what we don't deserve to being a supernatural endowment from the Father. So in other words, there's more to grace than what meets the eye. Grace is literally a supernatural endowment from the Father, from God. And what does that endowment do? It influences our soul so that when we're downtrodden, he, he can lift us up, right? 
When we're fearful, he can give us peace. He can give us joy. He can help us to overcome whatever is before us. But he also gifts us through this. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet this out in scripture. So don't worry about it. Amen. But he keeps us and he gives us affection. He gives us that love. Hallelujah. So the Bible portrays grace as God's generous and undeserved gift to humanity, offering forgiveness, redemption, and salvation. And it's best described as being given what you do not deserve or what you did not earn. We also learn that grace is different from mercy. Mercy is defined as not getting what you deserve. And grace is being given what you don't deserve. So that's the difference. Grace is, I'm going to give you something that you didn't earn, something that you don't deserve, but mercy is, I'm not going to give you what you really deserve. Remember, I gave the example of, I kept getting in trouble with my parents, and next minute you know, where I should have got a spanking, I didn't get a spanking. They gave me mercy because I didn't get what I deserved. I had cut up, and I should have got my behind tore off, but they didn't. So... We left off talking about grace is something that is given, not earned. Amen? Because what happens is we have this theology that we have to be good little boys and good little girls and we'll get to go to heaven. And basically what that is is a merit-based or an earned Christianity. Now, if you do your research, you'll actually see that in the Catholic Church, one of the things that they taught is that you could buy your way into heaven. Did y'all know that? You could buy your way? Yes, you got to do your research. So what they would do is they would sell, because that's what it literally was, through your offerings, you could buy your seat into heaven. You would give big offerings, big tithes, and that would guarantee your way into heaven. And so what that did is it taught people that, if I give enough money, if I act good enough, then I'm going to make it to heaven. Have you ever noticed that people say that they don't have to come to church anymore? Why is that? What are some of the reasons that you hear why people don't have to be in the house? They're good enough. I'm, I'm a good person. So why do I need to go to church? Come on, Terry. I hear them say that um, they feel closer to God when they're out in creation. Huh. Let's talk about that. They feel closer to God when they're out in creation. Do you know what that ties to? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a different spirit. Universalism. They're worshiping the universe. They're worshiping the created versus the creator. And so that universalism, allows them to see the universe as what gives them good things. When the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights. Oh my. So now we've got a problem because they're over here talking about the nature is giving me what I need when it's Jesus Christ. So what happens if you're locked in a prison and you can't go outside? We read in Acts uh, 16 where Paul actually was able to still have joy and praise and worship God all the way through while he was in chains and bonds. He was in shackles. He was imprisoned. But yet he was still able to praise God. So that means if you can't go outside, you lose your joy, but I don't. Why? Because I have a relationship with the Father. I don't need nature. If you read uh, Romans 1, it actually digs into that. And it starts to talk about how they worship the four-footed beasts and all of these other things. And, and how their focus became on the created instead of the creator. What other reasons do we hear that people don't need to, I don't need to come to church anymore? They watch it on TV now. Oh. So I can get everything that I need just watching on television. What's the problem with that? Because I'm, I'm watching a sermon. I'm getting the word. Why is that a problem? I need a microphone by you.
You're not in the house with the people. They're not in the house with the people. And, and why is that important? In Hebrews, it says, forsake not the assembly of ourselves. Are you able to pull that up? Do you think you feel comfortable doing it? I also, I don't know where I read this too. I heard that in order for you to grow and learn more about God and get closer to him, it's important for you to surround yourself by the um, Hebrews 10, 25 people that are more knowledgeable and more uh, experienced in teaching you how to get closer to God. Okay. So a lot of people, that's, that's good. A lot of people believe that God, God will teach me anything that I need to know. I don't have to go to church. A lot of them are concerned that somebody's going to ask them for money. A lot of them are concerned about the people in the church because they saw them at the club last night. <laughs> Here's the thing that we have to understand. We can come up with every excuse as to why we don't go to church. Thank you. Um, every excuse as to why we don't go to church. But the thing that we have to understand is Christianity was never about self. If that was the case, Jesus Christ would have never left the comfort of heaven, came all the way to earth to save all of us. He was always about the people, the souls that belong to God, right? He was always about the souls.